Welcome everyone to this um, really interesting and maybe a bit unusual, but we, we, we will see a webinar. Uh, it definitely has an unusual title, Tracking Time in, Country, in Crunchy Soft Media. And it's by uh, Professor Itai Aina from the University of Sydney in Australia. Um, we will get to the talk in a second, but I just uh, wanted to just very briefly um, remind you that we have some more webinars coming up. We'll have a break here in the month of August, but we will then begin again on the 1st of September. And um, we have an inter uh, interesting schedule, I think, for the, uh, for the fall. Um, but onto the webinar, and uh, as you might have heard, um, there is the possibility to ask questions using the Q&A uh, button there, and you can type in the questions either as we go along, or at the end of the webinar, we will have a, we'll have a session where Itai will, will answer questions, and it's also possible to raise your hand if you want to have a chat in person. So um, without further ado, I will uh, hand over to Itai. So if you if you start sharing your screen, it's I uh, yeah, I might thanks. have to stop sharing mine. Let me just share screen. Um, I'll do the I think the keynote should be the one. Yeah. Can can you see, Chris? You can see. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah, it's sure going this. well. Hang on. Before I start, I don't know how can I, oh, okay. All right, hello everyone. And uh, the first thing to do is, is, is really to thank um, Christian and, and, and I suppose and, and your brother Jürgen um, for this organization and bringing us together. <clears throat> uh, this is a fantastic initiative, I think. And I see that there's many interesting speakers coming up and I heard that Habui gave us a talk so so that that's really great christian thanks so much this is so important uh during these days uh also thank you christian for being a friend for so many years uh this is more important i guess but now let, let, let me go back to, yeah let me go back to to the talk now christian um, uh, invited me and, and that's a great honor and, and and asked me what i want to talk about and and basically um, I think that we gravitated to something a bit lighter and you will see that we are talking on a very light material, uh, literally in, in, in dual meaning. Um, and the um, title is Tracking Time in Crunchy Soft Matter. We try to claim that we have a new material. We discovered a new material. That's what physicists do. They always discover a new material. I'm not a physicist, but I would play physics here. Um, so it's a class of material, we'll call it crunchy soft media. Um, but really what it was all about, it was about the motto, today's motto, which I think it's, it's very important, I want to say, in those times, that's why we selected that topic. It is about um, the, the joy of science or the, the search for joy, inquisitio in gaudium. I searched it in Google Scholar, it was very hard. I flipped Google Scholar back and forth, back and forth from Latin to English, and that's the correct thing. But if someone knows Latin and want to correct me, please. But since it's a joy, I don't really mind. That's the idea here. It's the search for joy or the research into joy. Um, and of course, um, I suppose that most of you, if not all, can recognize that, that face. It is actually going very much in that thing. It's, it's just a Nobel, uh, laureate winner called Richard Feynman. And he was, um, he was um, very famous into, to, to popular, popularize science, apart from being just a, one of the brilliant scientists of all time. And he did many things apart from his Feynman, famous Feynman diagram in quantum mechanics and inventing the word, um, um, nanotechnology and, and doing all sorts of things like uh, saving and uh, understanding why a space shuttle collapsed and all of those kind of crazy things. He was a great communicator and he, he really see joys. You, if, you, if you don't know, just go to YouTube and search for his Feynman lecture. They're just unbelievable. And one of the things, for example, he would do all of a sudden, not like me, for me it will take 
uh, a year, but he would just in an afternoon solve the problem of why a plate doesn't really fall down after so long. You just spin it and it just spins and spins and spins. So he just did the variation of principles of that just in the afternoon because he's enjoying the question. And so that's what we are going to do. We are going to focus on the joy of science today. And uh, the joy comes from, from collaborators in, in this. Um, many people that have contributed it from my university and predominantly also from San Diego State University, two, two pillars of that um, and some usual suspects here. Uh, I really want to highlight two joyful individuals, as you can see. Um, Julio Valdez on the right from San Diego State University, my colleague that, that uh, together with him, we, we entered that uh, crunchy world. And then uh, an unbelievable boost of, of understanding that came with, um, with Francois, with whom I also um, submerged the wet material in fluid, as we will see. So this is the team. Um, and um, I want to, to start, the focus will be on time, tracking time. So if we want to talk about time, we might go to the times of uh, the Bible and prophetess Deborah. And if you don't understand Hebrew, most likely most of you, not all, do not, are not able to read those letters, but I can. It's Deborah, that's the name Deborah. And prophetess Deborah in, in her book, um, basically sang a song that um, in, in one of the things is that the mountains melted, in Hebrew it sounds better, but the mountains melted before the Lord. Um, and, and then um, basically that triggered the Reiner, uh, the, the father of, of rheology. So this was a theological uh, history, but now let's go to, to rheology. Reiner, um, is considered one of the fathers of, of, of uh, rheology, the study of, um, of the flow of material, um, suggested to consider the Deborah number, very famous number, uh, where you take the time of relaxation of an event and you divide it by the time of observation. And many of you here would probably be now PhDs and you know that the time of observation is three and a half years in Australia, you know, maybe four years in, in other countries, maybe five years in, in Germany, I don't know. Um, so this is your time of observation. You can't beat that, right? You need to finish your PhD. Uh, but the thing is that the material might, might, might not want to cooperate and might not relax. Uh, if you look at the glass of windows, it, it might not have enough time. But if you wait many, a lot of time, it will eventually melt. Basically, mountains melt in front of the Lord. This is the, the reason is because uh, the Lord has infinite denominator. He have infinite, she has infinite uh, time of observation, right? So the Deborah number in front of, of the Lord is always zero, essentially. And so for the Lord, the mountains are fluid. For us, the mountains are solid because we only have three and a half years to observe it, or maybe our lifetime for a mountain. So this is a very interesting thing to remember. And we will see many phenomena that you, you want to think about relaxation. They might take time and so on. So when we look at rocks, of course, we are living when we see an imprint of a rock on a rock. And we have lots of these kind of formations in Sydney. Um, you see those, those structures, and geologists will tell you those are compaction bands, pretty stationary, nothing moves. But you see, for the Lord, it moves all the time. It, 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 it moves and moves and moves. So when you see a picture in, in geology, you have to remember that that's a long, long movie there uh, that have brought it. So geological time and this interesting formation due to compaction, they tell you that this is compaction geologists, and they are great in, in storytelling. And, um, you know, geophysicists um, take this type of rocks to study the formation of those structures. And they are exposing it to experimental time, much, much, much faster, much shorter time. And they can see in X-ray, in this particular case, this traveling compaction. This is an X-ray of, um, of a carbonate rock, um, cemented rock, that basically you have the propagation of bend. And so things happen quickly, you increase the, the, the vertical stress, and you see these bands developing. Uh, of course, 
I want you to, to highlight the two things here. We can't really get to the stress levels that that particular rock might have been exposed. It might have been 10 kilometers under the, the ground when those formations might have formed in the past, right? We see it expressing itself on the surface. So one thing to remember is that we can't even do that in the lab, the type of stresses, and we can't even do the times. So we do things in lower stresses and faster times. And so when you look at the compaction band in nature, think about that. Um, so to beat that, we can also change the material to make it softer and more crunchy than rock, more porous than rock, so rice crispy. And you know, if you see here, there is a snap, crackle, pop. That's the add of Kellogg's. And, and that's actually fourth, fifth, and sixth derivative of uh, the motion, if you, you know. Um, so it's funny, scientific names as well. Um, if you take rice crispy, that, that's, that's the idea with Julio Valdez. Uh, maybe we can see those kind of bands and, and, and see it in a faster time, right? Because that's the way we can beat the time. So I'll shut up for a second. That's your pack of rice crispy. Just beautiful sound. And I want you to listen carefully. If you don't, and look what happened here. I don't know the resolution of time that you have on your screen, but basically you will see traveling compaction that you soon are going to indicate. And whenever the, the compaction then reach the top, it makes a beautiful, like, um, sound. Listen up. Listen when it comes to the end. Another time. When it reached the top, when the traveling band reached, that's what initially we just heard it. Then we said, okay, we need to do it in transparent box. So we could actually do PAV, particle image velocimetry. Um, and we can put here, we can take all the velocities from image analysis and condense them in every height. So what you see here is height, position. This is time. And the color represents the velocity of the quench um, at, at a given height. So here is the velocity. So the wh white is the piston velocity, in fact, and, and black is basically no motion whatsoever, it's the button. So over here it will always be black, over here it will be always the piston velocity, and that line represents the location of the piston. So that's called the spatiotemporal plot. So what you see is that initially, up to about 12 seconds in this particular experiment, Things are very erratic. They go, and it's really hard to identify that compaction band structure. But as time pro progresses, what happens, the system reaches a certain equilibrium, and then you see propagating band. Here, the band will go up, then it goes down a little bit, up, down, and then up, 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 up. It just go up suddenly. But initially, there was some up and downs, if, if, if you notice. Um, and in fact, if we run this particular example with exactly the same parameter, the same parameter, and we just repeat the experiment, it is not reproducible. <laughs> this material is not very cooperative. Sometimes it goes up, 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 up. Sometimes it goes up, down, up, down, up, down, all the way to the end. Sometimes it goes down, 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 down. You just don't know what you will get every time you run the experiment. You can get something else, which is for the same velocity, the same material, the same um, date of manufacturing. <laughs> That's what happened. It's a very um, chaotic system. I mean, it, it, it's a flip of a coin. Um, but the, what I show you here is what happened most of the time for this set. So mostly that's what happened. Now, what, what it means is that as the band travels and crosses through the set, it's actually grinding the Rice Krispies. Those bands are intense velocity gradient there, as you can see. So it grinds and it crush. So you have a crush in front that goes up. And when it hits the top, you get bang. It has a release of, of, of elastic wave at the top. So that's what we hear. Um, under the band, you basically, have, you basically have dark thing after a while, right? Above the band, you have white stuff. So that means this moves in this area in the piston velocity. 
this move here at no velocity. So the sharp gradient of color is actually a compaction band of intense uh, compaction of vertical strain rate, okay? Um, now what happened at the beginning? At the beginning, from the very beginning, if I play, you will hear the crashing. There is crashing from the very get-go of those grains. We can hear it, but it happens everywhere. Now remember that there is friction along that wall. So the stress at the top, is actually lower than the stress at the bottom because of friction. Um, that means that the grains over here are subjected to lower stress, so they tend to crash slower initially. So those grains here at the top are crashing faster. So as they crash faster, that means that this material here at the top is strengthening, strain hardening, if you want, much faster than at the bottom because it goes through higher strains. And as it goes through higher strain, it goes stronger. And as it goes stronger, the stress, which is, which is higher, to strength, which is also higher, is equal all across. So here it's high stress, high strength. Here it's low stress, low strength. So that is the point here, that roughly the stress to yield stress is roughly homogeneous across the sample, and you get that type of flip of a coin effect. All right? So great. What do we do about that? Uh, first of all, with Julio, um, we could take the gradient, and we can look at the localized uh, deformation, so that's actually before the test. And you see the compaction then goes up, hit the top, then it re-emerges the bottom and goes up, down, up, and, and that's basically what happens that I tried to describe. You could just see it now spatially on across the sample. All right, so how do we explain that? So we thought with Francois, Let's do the simplest model. No complicated NPM things you, and SPH. No, no. We've said, no, no, no. To understand, we, we do. I, I'm not able to do this kind of thing. So what we do, we do almost like the DEM, but in a lattice form. So we have nodes. Those nodes have masses like the DEM. You can think about those points as the center of grains, if you want. And we connect the grains through this kind of lattice of spring. Now we have 20 columns and 80. We could play with this. It doesn't really matter much for our discussion. On the sidewalls, we have free, um, we have at the moment frictionless sidewalls for that, that first analysis. At the top, we move the nodes at the constant velocity. There are masses here, so they're going to move by equation of motion. And those springs are given the reaction forces. But we are not going to use linear springs because this is a crunchy material. If I take a rice crispy bit and I compress it, you can imagine that the force displacement here would reach a certain stress level and maybe there will be a micropore popping and I'll lose the force temporarily. The fragments will go down. I'll, the piston basically doesn't touch anything. So the force will go down. This is a very simple, the idea is very simple model. We are saying, okay, it went through rice for one hierarchical pore collapse. I need to continue to load it to come up and obviously this force will increase to crash again. This is the length of the spring. This is the spring force, and that's what we are making. So what we are making is that the stiffness and the force are growing, increasing gradually, very, very slowly. Very, very slowly. So the spring can go many, 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 many breakage events. Um, and that's what we do. We have a mass M. We have an initial length of the springs, unit length L0. This is L0. We fix the bottom. I said about those boundary condition. And what we are going to do, we need the way we found to dissipate energy. And we are going to do it in various ways. Here I'm going to show you that each point here, each mass is going to be damped by a global damping, as if it is surrounded by a fluid, like air in the particular case. So, so as, as things move, they get resistance from the air. Later we will try with other way of dissipate. So each node here is going to be damped the motion is going to be damped to get back to equilibrium. Okay, so we can run our path trice model and compare it to experiment that I just showed you. So here's the experiment, a different experiment, slightly even more coherent, is the experiment. We take the simulation and, and we get it. But you see top, up, down, up, down, up, down in the experiment. Simulation, it's, I'm, I, I told you, I'm going to show you 80% of the time goes bottom up. 20 other percent, it goes top down, up down, up down, like here. I just want to show you so that you keep in mind that flip of a coin effect. 
But that's basically it. So now the beautiful thing, once you got a simple model, you can say, let's take the simple model and change the velocity of the piston, make it slower or faster. So here is a slow simulation, much, much slower, 100 times slower. This is 100 times faster than that. So you see things here, the velocity, you can't really see any coherence. It goes up, down, up, down, crazy. It, it pops everywhere. That's a messy, erratic motion. And this is a coherent, very homogeneous structure. You would think elastic, but it's not. It's a diffuse failure. All of the media participate in crashing here because it's so fast. So, okay, so we got that. We got very excited, the simulation tells us. And then what you do, and I swear, First, we had the simulations. You said, Julio, you need to re retrofit uh, your device because we need much, much faster things. So Julio goes and go for colleagues and, and has to rearrange his entire sample so that he could do super fast loading and super slow loading. And that's what we get from the experiments. And that was the good case that you, you, you develop a very simple model, you challenge the conditions, you then discover things and you said, right, we need to change the experiments to search for those effects and it works. So then you feel really good where the model leads discovery. Um, and so if we want to understand what really happened, now we have the model. Now we have the model. Of course, the experiments can give much more, but now we can use the model. So this is now from the model. So that's the erratic, the very, very slow loading. And we can actually uh, look at the breakage, how often springs break. And we can do it on a unit of time and we can coarse grain it and we can get basically frequency of breakage events. And this is the erratic and it correlates very well with, it's, it's basically creating this mess. You can't see coherent breakage events. But when you have that up and down effect, like you saw, you see that there is, that where you have the shear, the, sorry, the, the vertical strain rate is where you also have the crashing. So basically the gradient correlates with breakage rate. And that goes where these lines are. And this is a very fast uh, loading, everywhere it crash, and that creates a homogeneous thing. Great. Um, we found out that by slight perturbation of condition, we don't only get one band going up and down. We can even get two bands going like that. So it's two bands means that you split the sample into three. A top that moves with the piston, a middle that is an intermediate velocity, and a button that is not moving at all. And those, those regions just keep on flipping. Uh, that's, that's in the simulations. We tried in experiments. We, it's very hard because it's a very noisy system. So we kind of see it, I can tell you, but I can tell you as well that we don't see it. It is hard to validate whether you see something as coherent as simulation can do. I should say simulation were all regular. Initially, the lattice does no stochastic, there's no, there's no randomness in the spring, they're all the same. It's just enough to trigger some heterogeneity from the boundaries, which are actually no motion boundary, uh, slip boundary. And then, because of numerics, it's just enough to trigger all those, those things. You can add the heterogeneity to the spring or not, you will still get the same result. And that's beautiful. It means that it's very robust. Thing. Okay, so what can we do? We can take our system, we knew all the dimensions, and we can find the times of the material from the dimension as group of time. So for example, H is the size of the sample, initial size, it's just the initial. V is the velocity of the piston. So V over H has, has, um, or H over V has units of time, of loading time. It's basically the, how fast I move the sample. But I want to know how quickly, and I translate it to the force of breakage so I can get how fast it takes to break a spring. So this is the time of, of breakage, we call it. You have the regular in a lattice, you can do it for continuum, as you know, the square root of uh, rho over, over the bulk modulus here, it's, it's for a spring system, you get the elastic wave time, relates to the to grind. So those are the units. You can also have the damping time, basically, due to viscosity. So this is for global damping. We did it for other. So now you have three times, you can divide them and you get two dimensionless group. That's all the parameters in our system that are relevant. 
Um, as we do that, we have here, we call it breakage elastotine, uh, the uh, elastic number. And this is a breakage viscosity number. We, we pull out, there's no more times here, but it gives us the relativeness of time, like um, Deborah, right? But now we are looking a bit more physical. So for example, these guys over here are all diffuse compaction. That happens in very fast loading when you break the breakage time is very slow because it's very fast you just you, you load quick and so it breaks quick but what happened is that there's not enough time this is meaning that there's not enough time for the um, oscillations of the springs to damp so what happened is that you participate in breaking all the springs they're never able to and it's rigid, the, the, the viscosity gives rigidity to the system that transmits through and break all the grain here on this side. On the other hand, if I go very fast, eh, sorry, very slow, in between breakage events, I have time to relax back to a new kind of localized equilibrium. So I'm relaxing down and then I need to push myself back to breakage. So there's time for me to be broken. The fragment, could need, if you think physically, needs uh, to, to and here in the middle you get all those glorious things that we saw at the, at the experiment this is the the one that we were after the one band going up and down this is two bands this is three bands that cross the sample and you can put that on the map and, and and see that in this case the break or elastic things separate basically essentially those bands we can put different modes of, of damping and it would not change the concept of course, quantitatively it will change. If you run model with, with different randomness and think quantitatively things will change, but not qualitatively. You will get separation into a variety of patterns. And so this is a local damping between the, within, you know, parallel to the, the spring. Uh, this is, we apply friction to all the masses we have in the system as if friction is, is emanating through. It's a different mode of, of, of dissipation and we still get it. We increase friction, for example, we go from um, uh, basically diffuse to, for, for the same loading rate, we, think we go from um, diffuse to erratic. The thing is that, that really, that was great because when, when Julio did the experiment, he actually used the sandpaper to roughen the boundary and he added friction and you go for exactly as, 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 as predicted, which was great. Okay, what about other materials? So, um, this is snow. People did the same test in snow, dry snow. And um, this is our simulation. They had a different model, much, much more complicated mathematical model uh, that has all the sintering effects of snow, whatever. But it's essentially a collapse of pores um, in our model. So you have also those kind of uh, bands also in snow. This is Adrian, I, know that I knew that you're going to be here. So Adrian is, is one of the audience in the University of uh, Sunshine Coast. And it sounds a very cold place indeed, uh, Sunshine Coast. This is experiments he did in Antarctica with CPT. And you can hear the sound. This is a CPT. Thank you, Adrian. I always like to thank you on that one, you don't know. Um, and then the sound I want to, to register, that might be compaction. As far as I know from Adrian, it's not from the machine, it is from the snow. So we are going to register that. So we saw the bands that they exist and we hear it most potentially. Alloys have a similar thing. You get those serration on the stress over time um, and, and, and that are making these bands that they see, Luder's bands and, and um, other sorts of bands. It's PLC effect in alloys and they, I, I won't go to the explanation, but of the, the, the atomic level of, of those alloys, but basically to get an effective constitutive law, they say that the, the force or the strength, let's say, has to go through a strain rate hardening like we are used to, right? We know from clay as faster, stronger, right? We are always like that. But actually what they say, in order to get those bends, you need also a strain rate softening and then followed by hardening. So basically what happened is that as you harden up, at some stage you get to the peak and your material can't take it. So you get an instability and jump over here. You get into those kind of loops. That's what, how they explain it. Loops in the force, because the strength cannot hold this, the force that you're trying to put in. So you start getting this 
you know, ideas, and then you get those serrations. Um, the thing is, the similar thing exists in snow. Similar thing exists in snow. This is Kirchner. It was a Royal Society paper, I think. And I remember Johan Gaon point, pointed this out, and we were very happy. So it also goes strain rate hardening and strain rate softening. Um, and so the thing is, I want you to remember this is snow. There was a an earthquake. I was on my way to France. Um, I got on a plane, I can't remember, in Europe from one place in 2007. I think it was in 18 January 2017. I was up on the plane. And I hear about the earthquake for a miserable area that I remember that have a lot of earthquakes. And I was like, oh, damn, again, this region gets earthquakes. And as I land, one and a half hours later or so, I open again my, my mobile phone and I see there was an avalanche in the same region. And I'm registering and said, oh, it must be the earthquake. Earthquake trigger, a snow avalanche. So indeed, there was, this is the avalanche. It killed 30 or 31 people in, in Hotel Rigopiano, sitting here. And there was an avalanche coming from here. This is the earthquake. And there were a set of them. The last one about half an hour to 40 minutes um, before, before avalanche. And so, okay, I registered it. Then, then I saw my friend Thierry Fogg, my colleague from University of Grenoble, who was interviewed about that, that avalanche in the French TV. And I asked him, did you tell them that it's because of the earthquake, the avalanche? He said, no, 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 no. Not allowed to say that to the snow community. I said, there must be surely time of relaxation and all of that things. I said, yeah, sure, but you don't want to say that to snow community. There's no notion of time there. So I said, no, 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 no. And I registered that. And so in my way to Zurich to meet my supervisor that with whom I never worked since my PhD, we always meet a yearly basis at least twice and have dinners and laugh and everything. I never do anything. We say, oh, we always say, let's do something. This is very famous and rich professor, as you can see. And he's like in, uh, this is in, uh, in uh, Lake Luzerne, and this is his big yacht. And, um, you know, in dinner, I'm like, suddenly it feels, we always say we need to do something. I said, oh, I know what we should do. We should solve that Rigo Piano thing. I just talked with Thierry, my friend, and, and, and you know, there's, it's not allowed, but I remember your model. You have this time delay. Let's add it to your snow avalanche, to your landslides. We'll do it for snow, we'll learn snow. So, so Sasha, myself, and, um, and Thierry set up to solve that thing. And within a month, we basically got it. And it was on the basis of that hardening versus... Fog. This was a key ingredient that was missing in snow model. I won't bore you with the details, but that allowed us to, to solve the mystery of the delay. It took effort to explain that, to convince snow people. But I think they're starting to see the light that it is actually what it is. It's such a comprehensive model. It's the most comprehensive model of snow, I would say, avalanche right now. I was told by some snow people um, that are, understand stuff. Anyway, so that's just to convince you about that mechanism significance. What happened is that as an avalanche is formed, you have a creeping things that you have at your you form the nap, uh, 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 you crack the, the, the snow, then you have um, at the end of the, of the crack, you have a, a mechanism of holding the crack from further propagating because you can harden your snow. But once you get to that peak, it bursts and you get it. So you can use that model to basically, and the actual parameters with no plane to actually predict time of, of delay. Okay, so, Back to rice bubbles. So what can they tell us about strain rate effect? Um, so here are tests on different rates from 0 0.01 millimeter per second to, th this is the fast one, 300 millimeter per second. Huh? It's like, beep, finished. This is very smooth, very smooth, very smooth. And then we start getting those serrations. And you can see, this is one. Um, oh, this is our simulations. They are staggered by, just to show the difference in the line, just artificially by here, 50 kPa here by unit of that. It's different, different type of line, but um, if you add some stochastic, it will be very similar. And we are 
getting that type of modes in the force displacement, in the stress strain. And you wonder, how can now we use that to ask strain rate to soften? So we can take the experiments and we can change the rate. For example, this is, look at the red. This is 0 0.1 millimeter per second. We can slow it down. You slow it down and the stress jumps up. This is a strain rate softening. We're not used to it most of the time. We are expecting the opposite, right? And as you're increasing, it goes down. But at some stage, if you increase it, um, it, it has that type of effect of going down up. That's what we saw that snow has. So this is from the experiments. We take regions of strain. This, is this, this region of strain is giving me that type of stress, average stress. Um, this is a different region and a different region. So you get that kind of strain rate effect, strain softening followed by hardening. This, we can run simulation, get more coherent things. That's the advantage of, of simulations. And indeed, you can get strain rate softening followed by hardening. But the beautiful thing that we learned here is that even though that we didn't bring anything of that sort into our springs, all the glorious bands I showed you are happening when you have strain rate hardening. Now, models of alloys require a soft strain rate softening. The physical results here is that even if you're just hardening the material, you can still get localization. Okay, enough. Let us have fun again after all that, uh, that, 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 that physics-based stuff. What happened with fluid? So, motivation. This is um, a rock field dam. You have a river of water and it starts sucking with capillarity, suck, suck water. And what people observe is that the, the rock field dams collapse. And we said, okay, let's do it with milk. Add it into our Rice crispy. So that's the analog of that geotechnical problem. You put milk or water um, and you put constant weight like the dam and you let capillarity at this level start doing things and you hope that you will discover something with this breakfast test. And this is the test. Here is a zoom with our macro type of uh, picture. You see ski milk. I will give you the percent if you really want of the fat. We did it with water. We did it with full milk, full cream milk. It happens. And look at, at that. Look at the Quaker. This is not because your screen is flickering of delay. Look at it. Now we change the view and it, it, you do that, you put it, I really suggest you do it with kids. Actually, a, a kid from Hawaii contacted me for his science fair. He won the award in Hawaii. He was been doing amazing research. I wish I, he was my PhD, an 11 year old thing. So that's the, the effect. And if I run that, the lab, every time you see, you see those quakes, we call them rice quakes. Pack, pack. So what happened here is if under here, it's, it's let's say fully saturated. Somehow there is capillarity rise within the crispies. We can't really see because they are the holding the smallest pore. You know, when you put a sponge in water, it goes smaller pores, goes more. So the, we believe the fluid is within the rice crispies, eating away the rice crispy until you have collapsed and boom. This is the force. This is initially what we do is we, we put water. It goes through immediate consolidation up to an equilibrium. And we try to keep the stress fixed with the servo. But what happened? We keep getting these stress drops. But the distance between the stress drop, which we can measure, we can measure the delay between those drops, right? It's just simple uh, uh, you know, data analysis is, is prolonged. Though the, and you could see it here. It, it longer and longer and longer between. This is 10 times faster than the real experiment. You come next day, it's still doing quakes. And every time you do the quake, you hear that. Listen. Now, I, at the beginning, it was faster, but that's what I have here. This sound. Remember the snow by Adrian McCann, that, that from Antarctica? Very similar sound. I, I want to, to point out, I don't know. It's fun. OK. So what you could do, you could do spatio-temporal. You can take a line of pixel and, and just plot it over time, that line of pixel. And this is time, this is the, 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 pic, the, the line of pixels. And what you see is how it kind of consolidates downward. 
So you see these, these points are the rice quakes, are the sudden collapse. And in between, you see that, that it actually creeps down. So there is a creep in between rice quakes. Rice quakes are a sudden big event. So what we believe is that there is saturation. So the problem is that if you, if you want to do water retention in Rice Krispie, like geotechnical water retention, the Rice Krispie doesn't cooperate. It's smudged and collapsed. That's why we have rice quakes, right? So you need to find a geotechnical rice crispy to understand it. And, and that's like taff and uh, leca and perlite. Let's call them geotechnical rice crispies. And people have measured the water retention or the saturation of a depth above full saturation. It looks pretty exponential for highly, highly, highly porous media. And we had the idea that it is an exponential with the length of capillarity, which we get um, from comparing the force of capillarity to the gravity force. So that's the surface tension. That's the micropore size that control that length. Gravity, so this has been given by people that do hydrology. And this is the density, um, the density of the fluid here. So we have all of those parameters and we know the capillarity length. So, so that's roughly, it's working. Now, this is Leonardo. I don't know if he's here. Leonardo is, is Francois and my PhD student, and he's doing brilliant work. This case is, is with X-ray, because we, we start taking and we, we did things with centrifuge. I don't know if, uh, you know, with centrifuge in the, in, in, in COFs, in, in the Center for Offshore Foundation or the UWA. And we do crazy stuff. We do neutron tomography to Rice Krispie. We're getting crazy. Here is the kind of water front. And this is very accelerated experiment. And what Leonardo did, he managed to convert the, from density the degree of saturation. He used X-ray to measure saturation profile. So this is saturation profile over time. So, so that's the beginning, 250 seconds. And at the end, it's here. And when you're at the very end, it is an asymptotic. It doesn't actually change the saturation profile. Leonardo did a very clever image analysis here. Um, then he did even more clever. He actually, with, with Alessandro, my former PhD student who ran neutron tomography, they were able to do all the reconstruction of the Rice Krispies. I don't have a picture for you right now. And also separate the fluid phase, kind of. I mean, that's what Leonardo did. And what he did, Leonardo, there was full tomography, full tomography with the neutron that can separate the fluid. He could have the top, the, 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 the boundary, the yellow is kind of the boundary between the, the fully dry to the saturation profile. And the bottom, I don't know if you can see, so there is, what happened is that during all that episodes, it's like the water saturation profile is fixed in space. That was our assumption when we set to develop a model. We assume that we have a profile of saturation that is an exponential with this, with this LG that control the, the exponential decay of the water uh, retention here with height. We know everything that controls this LG. And those, we, we believe that, we, we think in the modern, in the simplest way, we think about the train of carriages, the porous, each carriage, and they are submerging this fixed uh, saturation profile. And at the bottom, it's the most saturated. At the top is, is, is actually fully dry. So each carriage is, is attacked by milk or water and smudged over time. And we use a simple model we saw in, in a journal of Rice Krispie somewhere. I, I don't know, it was maybe Kellogg's journal. Or so. I forgot the journal. It was some food science type of thing. I managed to read the paper there. It was very important. That basically tell me that, that basic, the stiffness of the system is attacked over time with the degree of saturation. I could interpret it. They had different words to things. They are talking in a different language. And so this is kind of a damage variable to the Rice Krispies that as, as it is exposed to saturation and to saturation profile, it, is, it is, is continuously going down. It could be attacked by different saturation because it consolidates. And I decrease my, my stiffness. So I might start my stress here at P star, but I'm being smudged and being aggressively changing my K by this low. So, so my K changed and I, need, I now belong to this stress strain curve. My peak is here, but I don't load it. I fix my load because this is a fixed load control test. So what happened is that I bring my yield stress all the way to my actual stress. At that moment, I collapse. This is the model, I collapse and I jumped. This is a quake 
for a carriage. I jump here. So now you have basic deformation from two parts, a creep part for the carriage and a, and a rice creek part, as we saw in the spatial temporal. And you can now integrate the whole effect of all the carriage. There's only one that always been, um, quake happens that at the, once it happens, you, you're out of the game. You're just smudged and you're here. But you have to continuously sum up the saturation to all those other things that didn't have a quake. As you do that, you can actually predict the time of quake for all the carriages, which comes out, so I'm a bit of Taylor here, comes out those, that you can predict the gap of quakes in that simple model in terms of all those physical phenomena. So surface tension, the micropore size, the, the density of fluids, the, the gravity, okay? So this gives me the growth time, this delay that is prolonged, prolonged between quakes. Um, and I can put that. So this is the measured, the line, the black line is the measured time delay. The line is this formula, is this formula, delta T equal lambda T. So it works if my, the only thing I don't know here because I know my surface tension, I know all of this. The only thing I don't know is the micropore size. It works with 0 0.6. Now, Francois, go and take with the knife and cut 20 rice krispies and we perfectly fit circles here. So this is the science we did here. No fancy fancy thing. And we got the probability. And this is the 0 06. So it sits very nicely in the mode here. And it looks pretty realistic, let's say here. Now you can also do more. You can actually do mechanics. You can sum up the deformation in the springs, in the carriages as they are deforming over time. You can take the crashed one, which is the, 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 is, is, is the jumps and you can sum up the uncrushed one, which is the creep part. And you can even take the discrete nature of this and smoothen it by thinking that the time gap is actually time of integration. So you can get the smooth deformation over time and get the creep low, which is all by them. So what's nice about this train model of crashing is that you get the creep low. And you can do the experiment is the black line with all those jumps. You saw the experiments. This is different degrees of idealization of our numerical model or, or analytic model. We have analytic and numerical, numerical Lagrangian, numerical Eulerian, whatever. And the, the green line is the smoothened, the smoothened result. And this is the creep low. So this is a physical thing that we can say, okay, here is our creep constant coming out of this from physical quantities, which is kind of nice. I'm, I'm, I'm now about to finish. Um, that seeing that was remarkable and then it came to my, our attention that there is something called ice quakes in antarctica antarctica is like 2000 meter thick ice adrian will correct me um and there is a very famous uh, subglacier under the, the the glacier lake of rivers melt molten river that go under the ice uh, so and on top of that that, that lake of rivers, um, there is 2,000 meter of ice. So I said, maybe, you know, maybe there's ice quakes. And indeed, there are actually from that lake, Williams, twice daily, an ice quake, seven Richter. Can you imagine? Twice daily, you go to Antarctica, every day there is two ice quakes, seven Richter, equivalent to seven. Now you don't feel it because the frequency is different, but the amount of energy is equivalent to, to that such an such, uh, earthquake. That's amazing thing that comes up all the time. And you look at this, remember those first time? It looks with those quakes, you have that. And what happened from 2004 to 2011, the speed is slowing down. It, the, 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 there is the growing and growing delay. And if you put our model, you can imagine that basically LM here, the, the size of the micropores within ice is much, 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 much smaller. So our lambda is, is much smaller than in Rice Krispie. And that kind of the, the idea, maybe, maybe it's another thing. So this was like a hyperbole idea. Um, and we make claims in our paper and just, just in, a, in, in a humoristic things, that, you know. Uh, so it was, uh, I just want to say now, now the fun bit, right, is the search into joy. Bring people 
to listen. And people, uh, kids from Hawaii, journalists always like I got um, so much, uh, we got so much attention <laughs> to this research, not from the scientific community, <laughs> from people that want to participate with discussion with scientists more than even, even uh, scientists. And the New York Times uh, interviewed Julio and uh, they, they looked at our P the recent PRL and they came up with this drawing. I absolutely got excited. That basically they suggest to use delicious snack for these practical problems of damping car accidents. Think about that. Maybe we should do that. And that got them interested. But it's not the only interest. I got many, many uh, journalists being interested from, and I'm showing you the highlights. Here, I, I'm afraid it should have been a plural. I don't know why. Guy was uh, from, from the Times of London interviewed me and, and he, he decided, he read our paper, that we solved, if you read this article, we solved sinkhole with Rice Krispies. There's no need to do sinkhole research. If you are doing it, stop. Rice Krispies solved the problem. And finally, Christian, are you there? I only see myself. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm nearly there. Uh, I just, I thought maybe I'll see. Finally, my best quote, from the famous journalist of agedcare101.com.au. I'm going to put it, this was my favorite after all of this. Aussie scientists saving the world's ice shelves from collapsing using rice bubbles. Yes, really, University of Sydney researchers are working out how to stop our planet from falling apart by using the beloved breakfast fair to imitate snow and rocks. Of course. Um, and so final words about our motto and about the, the, the talk, which is more important than the scientific discovery, is that science should be joy. If you start, if you don't have joy, if you're struggling, it's not science. I mean, it should be joy, to my mind, and that's the motto. Joyful science does not require funding. You just use Rice Krispie and milk, it's $5 less. Um, by the way, when I worked with UWA, with my colleagues, with Christophe Godin, uh, I brought the money for the material. They spent, spent that was the agreement, they spent the centrifuge. They had to vacate the uh, operation of uh, $1,000 an hour, but, <laughs> but I paid for the material. Um, for first order understanding, I really, when you see phenomena, it is the best is to think about simple models. You have no clue what to do. You have to, to dare to develop crazy models. You have no ideas. You have to think about mechanism. And the last thing I want to do at that stage is to come up with a comprehensive model. I need it to be with springs or something very simple so I can crack it initially. That's my, my, my approach, our approach in Sydney. Then once we've done that, we consider, I mean, what can they tell us about other systems like ice quakes in Antarctica, like sinkholes? I mean, is there something to learn about what we just gained from the simple models? And if you want to get journalists' uh, attention, just save the world like we do, right? That's when they are really interested. And finally, for more confidence, of course, we need a more advanced model because I don't trust the model for predictions or anything, just for learning. Inspire. Um, mechanisms. Now that we have it, we need to think how we generalize it. Then we can study it for different boundary conditions, different this. This is not my job right now. This is the future. That's what we do. We have David Riley that is going to how to put it in NPM or some some SPH or something a little bit more advanced to generalize things and to test other materials. That's the philosophy of joyful research for me. That's it. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you very much, Yutai, for a very interesting um, and uh, stimulating presentation with a uh, with a lot of um, a lot of really interesting stuff in there. I think we'll we will open up for questions if there are any, um, either um, type questions. Um, Christian, to just just to let you know that I. I can't see uh, anything right now. When I share the screen, I can't see who is asking questions. So I guess, please, if you can just moderate the question. Sure. Um, I think you can open up the Q&A if you sort of 
top or it doesn't, either at, at the top or at the bottom? It doesn't pop up when I share screen. Um, oh, yeah, 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 you're right. Sorry. But, but, but let me ask you a question, Itai, um, and you sort of touched on it at the very end there. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm a sort of a more, more practically inclined, and, uh, and, and my question was um, actually from the very beginning, how do you, how do you bring these models um, from, they're not really material, they're not really considerative models, right? They're sort of um, toy models in a way, right? As you say, to Absolutely. understand uh, what's going on. How would you bring those concepts, for example, with the, with the lattice models, with the, with the collapsing springs, into sort of the framework of uh, uh, boundary value problems? Any, any yeah. ideas? Uh, well, first of all, you can use the lattice. Yeah, first of all, you can use the lattice model almost like you use DM to solve boundary value problem. But I don't really think that's when you get practical results as you are after, right? You need to coarse grain the information to, to inform, in my humble preference, <laughs> to create continuum models like you do, right, with Optum. Uh, yeah. I, I think that, 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 is the, that is the essential step to get to engineering practice. Uh, DM is great as, as, as another bridge of learning, but then you need to end up with, with a continuum. And so what, you, what, what the, in physics you do, you coarse grain the thing into the continuum. Now we have actually, we are, we are developing a continuum model that will generate, that has the ingredients for those quakes. Uh, actually a PhD student that just got into it and it's the development with Miles Rubin from Technion. So uh, I didn't want, I don't want, you know, that's the nice thing here. I try to keep on the understanding, but of course the next level to get yeah, practical, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's that. Um, yeah, so, so, by the way, I should say, I mean, um, you choose this, this topic that is non-practical. I gave you also some practical. No, no, no. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's really interesting, but then, but then it's, and, and it's, it's, it's just some, some really powerful models, right? I mean, these are really, really complex problems if you want to tackle them using sort of the conventional approaches. Uh, I don't know how you do that uh, without really getting into a lot of trouble, uh, at the very least. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, what about what about lattice models in general? Is that something you have been uh, um, see any future in? Because I mean, you, you see it from time to time, and it sort of goes away. Um, look, that's just easier for, for, to for, for things like, program like, 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 like a fracture and brittle material. Oh yeah, I mean, when when, when you look at uh, peridynamic, it's it's a beautiful bridging thing between continuum and lattice, I, I think that that has a lot of scope because you can use the lattice to inform the elasticity and the fracture in, in like almost like atomistic level. It's almost, yes, I, I mean, I, I don't know if you're familiar with peridynamic, I, I find that an awesome way um, to, 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 to go forward from lattice to continuum. But uh, generally speaking, I'm really, as you know me, I am a I'm, I'm very much in the constitutive continuum framework. So uh, sure, sure. while I do all of that, I, I don't think that, you know, I think that's the way of learning. That's the point. That's the way of the science is this. This is, was the point. I don't believe in this model in its general, in, in, its, its, in its wider scope of confidence. That's my point I'm saying. I wouldn't get confidence from lattice model. I'd like to see continuum. <laughs> A, a comment, I think, but it's an interesting comment um, uh, that uh, in your final words you said that joyful science doesn't require funding. Any any more comments on that? <laughs> of course, if you give me more money, I'll be happy. That's my only comment to add. <laughs> and do if some panelist, if someone is reviewing my proposal, though I don't have any proposal outside, please give me money. I will be happier. Yeah. But no, that's a, that's a superficial happiness, really. And, and sometimes if you don't get funding, think about doing other things. You don't always need funding. It's, we tend to be slaves of funding in my mind. We tend to be slaves of what the system dictates. We feel like our success is linked to how much funds we bring to the university. For me, the success is how, how you learn, how you joy. I mean, your joy is your success at the end. It's not even how people will appreciate you or definitely not journalism. 
is how um, how much joy you get from your work. That is the best success for me. And of course, I'm a professor. I don't need to go through promotion, so I can say that. But I mean, once you reach this point that you understand joy is the is the ultimate goal, then funding yeah. is not linked to it yeah, in yeah. my mind. Yeah, no, I, I, I very much agree with you. I was thinking also actually in the context of teaching, I know this is maybe not something uh, we need to talk about here, but um, there's, I think we have some questions. Joy, there's, a, there's a lot more joy in finding things out than being told things, right? So um, students might complain that you don't tell them everything, but at the end of the day, they will, they will, uh, um, they will appreciate it. So yeah, some more technical questions. Um, uh, Possible um, creep deformations of carbonate sands, which can undergo crushing at the particle contact points. Yeah, I mean, very good question, and and very much hitting the nail there in terms of our interest. So, so this is this is another thing here. Is you do that, you say not practical or whatever. Actually, trigger a lot of practical things. On that's what maybe missed a bit. Um, then. The fact that you can use such a simple model to come up with the creep rate thing, which only depends on fundamental properties, like micro size of pores and things like that. And another thing I want to say, just before I go to the question on creep, and I will say what, what, what I, we do, creep for in the rice krispies, not maybe also in carbonate sense, is made of two, two things here, a, a, an episode between quakes and the quake itself. Now the green line, which is the continuum, it is actually a continuum, the result, I forgot to say. This is how we got continuum from our model. We did, we, we reverted this, this summation that is part of the discreteness of the nature. We could find a limit, which is a, a smooth limit and differentiate it to get a creep low, which takes both of those effects into both the quake and the creep in between, which come from the activation with chemistry, right? And that's our low. Now, that's a very simple model. I wouldn't have much confidence to predict now creep uh, under embankment or creep uh, in, in calcareous soil. But we do have now a project. I got funding from the Australian. This is true. I mean, I do like to have funding to do more practical things. I told them that I'm going to, and people believe me. And I'm still playing with the Rice Krispie, but we are, but really to get the money, we had to talk about exactly those things. So we got exactly funds. This is what Leonardo, I showed his face. And David, uh, this is Leonardo. David is, is, is attending as well, I think. And we are having this project with Francois to study um, rice quakes in our carbonite cell and creep and all of that. So, so what we want is to have essentially a the, the chemical reaction. So, so Leonardo is building a, a test with carbonate. So this is the next level. This is exactly so. Bernadi just hit the nail there uh, with the question. Uh, yeah, that, another, that's the next. Another question. If I might be a little bit outside the scope of what we've been talking about, nevertheless, an interesting question um, that we might have some opinions on and. Uh, it says that for a person who is familiar with localization of rate independent models, um, so you, we have the classic sort of acoustic tensor framework there, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, 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 how, how does that change when you have uh, um, uh, rate dependent materials? He, uh, rate dependent? Well, first of all, I, I don't know if you know, I mean, we have done work. Uh, with breakage mechanics and um, with kind of Prezina rate effect into it. Yeah. And the rate was, it was a great way for us to regularize the problem um, and uh, basically have a, a propagation of a band and get the, you, you, you know, like you see in carbonate rocks. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was all within the acoustic tensor analysis where you're taking the determinant of acoustic tensor and you check whether, whether it is yeah. positive the moment it turns into negative, at that point it localizes, and what the rate does, it just actually hold it together. So that's uh, people. Some some people think it's not a physical. I think that that actually there is time to do with relaxation, and this time of relaxation is what controls the, the sort of the rate dependence of models. Um, but for that type of behavior that we have here, we need a bit more than that because unlike you have a hierarchy of pores and 
you have discrete events of collapse. So a simple model with a single ill surface with just, uh, you know, with, with breakage as a hardening parameters is not enough for those rich oscillations. So right now with David Riley, my other PhD, we are, we are going to look at, at a continuum model that could be actually have all those oscillations. Um, back to your first question. By the way, I do want to touch one question that I see uh, Joshua asked me uh, that I had to fund it myself. So I, I just want to say that's why I have students. They buy the rice crispy and the milk. So this is the answer. That's it. my problem. Yes. They have to have something to eat anyway, right? So. <laughs> we have another question. Um, shall I take the next one or Christian? Yeah, 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 please go. So David asked uh, from personal information with localization rate dependent models. What extra challenges to the classic acoustic? Ah, that was the question that was asked. So, oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. What are the questions? Right. I mean, I do think that the, the, the I, I do want to add one thing is that in that world of localization, um, I know we had a lot of discussion, Christian, and I really like your philosophy to come up with a mathematical ingredient that will hold it together. Think that the physics also has to recover and, and meet in the middle. We had a lot of these discussions. So one of the things that I feel is a bit missing when we do constitutive modeling, we lose, lose sight sometimes of, of the physics. And I think physics, we don't know where we put the length scale. So one put the length scale on rate effects in viscosity, that, that kind of what's happened here. But Ada could have the length from non-local theory, which is for me not really clear what it is that we are integrating on that length. Some other people, like I do right now with the model, might have a length in the diffusion equations, like the non-local effects or like a diffusion of granular temperature, which is the jiggling of the pieces. So somehow, Matt's mathematical approach lets you access various class of, of equations that will help you see the, the phenomena you're after, and they direct you to think. But on the other hand, also the physics direct you to think, and they need to somehow meet in between. And it's quite remarkable that when they meet in between, you got it. <laughs> and when, when they meet, you got it. <laughs> I think that's what is needed now, is, 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 is actually meeting maths and physics. Well, um, I think that's really time, and it was really interesting, and I, there's a huge amount of work has been done already, but I think there's still a lot more to come, so uh, we'll be looking forward to Oh, I, I want a final call for the audience. Please join the Rice Krispie community. We're not many people around the world. We are hungry for collaborators. Uh, we started the wet Rice Krispie community. Now that's a more advanced community. I'm not sure. I mean, you should start with the dry first and then move your way up to the wet crispy community. So please join. I mean, we are yeah. eager for more people. Yeah, great. Um, please uh, consider that and uh, get in touch with uh, with Itai. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. 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 We can, have a, we can have a small chat. All right. And uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for... Thank um, you, everyone, for attending. Yeah. Um, don't forget that we have um, some more webinars coming up, as I uh, indicated um, That's great. at the beginning. Just a very brief reminder again. Um, so we have August off, and then we will be returning with a bit of a vengeance in the, in the September where we have some really um, interesting talks. So uh, thanks again and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.